I want to show you something today that I just recently made aware of in my studies of the Jehovah's Witnesses and their view regarding the Christ. And it has to do with this passage in uh, 1 Timothy 6, specifically verse 16. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only Sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So as we heard in verse 13, Paul charges uh, Timothy, his protege, if you will, someone who he's uh, mentoring to be a pastor, in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus. So obviously, there are two individuals here in view, God, who's apart, set apart from Christ Jesus. And then he says that he should keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of Christ, the second figure there. Verse 15, which he, and then he seems to go back, Paul, to the first subject, that is God. And many translations you'll find actually add the word God here in these verses. So it would say something like, and God will bring about at the proper time and God who is blessed, etc. Because even the Catholic Protestant scholarship and obviously evangelical translators like the NASB, they have no problem in seeing that there are two figures here clearly distinguished, one being God, who is, by the way, the Father thousands of times in the New Testament, and His Son, Jesus Christ. So two figures, two different individuals, one being God and the other not being God, but Christ Jesus. And this God is given the appellations, sovereign, king of kings, lord of lords. Now, those are titles that are also applied to his son, Jesus. But again, these are titles that are well known to be applicable to other figures. So if you go to the Old Testament, they're applied to even pagan kings like Cyrus. And then verse 16, Paul goes back to this first subject of God, who alone possesses immortality, whom no man has seen, to him that is the first figure, God, be honor and eternal dominion. Now, the last phase here of this section, to him be honor and eternal dominion, amen. So this finishes with a well-known doxology, which is simply a form of praise in the setting of a hymn. In the New Testament, doxologies are applied to both God and Jesus. So we have uh, Ephesians 3. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly, than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So as you can see, similar language here used by Paul, the him there being this first subject he talked about, God, as opposed to Christ Jesus. The same in Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory, with his great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Again, I'm just showing you here how Paul is distinguishing between the first subject and the second subject, so two figures in the mind of Paul. And then we have another verse in the Timothy letter, 1 Timothy 1.17. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. As you can see, this is almost verbatim chapter 6, verse 16 we looked at. And the point again being that for Paul, the only God, who is the Father thousands of times, is set apart from this other figure who Paul believes to be the Christ, Jesus. As far as I know, Catholic Protestant tradition has usually agreed that, especially in 1 Timothy 6.16 and 1.17, 
this is a reference to the only God, that is the Father, and not Jesus. So it came as a surprise to me when looking at the JW.org website, I found this in their references to 1 Timothy 6.16. Do these words apply to Jehovah God or to Jesus Christ? These words apply to the one whose manifestation they describe, namely Jesus Christ. In comparison with humans who rule as kings and as lords, Jesus is the only potentate, and he alone has immortality. Since his ascension to the invisible heavens, no man on earth can see him with literal eyes. The JW Watchtower Organization, which is a wholly Unitarian, vehement anti-Trinity or anti-Catholic Protestant Orthodoxy organization, would apply this verse to Jesus and not to God. Not even the Orthodox do that. And again, in another part of their publication, further, it's certainly true that after Jesus' resurrection and ascension to heaven, he can be described as one whom not one of men has seen or can see. Granted, his anointed disciples would behold Jesus after their own death and subsequent resurrection to heaven as spirit creatures. But no man on earth would see Jesus in his glorified state. Hence, it can truthfully be stated that since Jesus' resurrection and ascension, not one of men has actually seen Jesus. But then if you go to the reference of 1 Timothy 1.17, they applied this verse, which is almost, like I said, verbatim to the previous one, to God to Jehovah, as the organization likes to call God the Father. Another title applied exclusively to Jehovah is King of Eternity. What does this mean? It's difficult for our limited minds to comprehend, but Jehovah is eternal in both directions, past and future. Psalm 90 says, even from time indefinite to time indefinite, you are God. So Jehovah never began. He has always been. He is rightly called the Ancient of Days. He existed for an eternity before anyone or anything else in the universe came into being, Daniel 7. Who can validly question his right to be the sovereign Lord? So why would this organization, this uh, staunchly anti-Trinitarian group, apply the one verse to Jesus? Well, according to their article, Christ's Return, Will You See It? It explains more than one way of seeing Jesus. That's why when Saul of Tarsus, on his way to persecute Christians in Damascus, met Jesus Christ, he saw no form or body, but only such a bright light that it blinded him. It was quite fitting that Jesus should have appeared to Saul in this manner, for the glorified Jesus is the exact representation of the person of his Father and God. And God is spoken of as the Father of the celestial lights. No man could see the glorious face of God and yet live. So, can humans on earth see the glorified Lord Jesus Christ? The Bible's answer is no. Of the glorified, immortal Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 6:16 6, says that he is one who dwells in unapproachable light, whom not one of men has seen or can see. So here, I started to see why they're applying this one verse to Jesus, and that's because in the organization's doctrine, they believe that Jesus has returned, and this happened in 1914. He has been reigning, they say, from heaven invisibly, and no one can ever see Jesus ever again. Unless you're a, what they call a spirit creature, you're an anointed saint, part of the 144,000. So apart from that special group, no one else can see or will ever see, apparently, Jesus ever again. This is further explained in another section here called Return of Christ in Reasoning from the Scriptures. Will Christ return in a manner visible to human eyes? John 14, 19. A little longer and the world will behold me no more, but you, Jesus' faithful apostles, will behold me because I live and you will live. Jesus had promised his apostles that he would come again and take them to heaven to be with him. They could see him because there would be spirit creatures as he is, but the world would not see him again. And then they compare this doctrine to that verse in 1 Timothy 6.16. 6, 
this is against uh, the organization's teaching that the dead are sleeping. And that is, uh, by the way, New Testament teaching that the dead are sleeping, all the dead. But they teach that part of the dead are not sleeping, called the 144,000, the anointed ones, the saints, are not sleeping. And they're actually in heaven right now as disembodied spirit creatures. So I'll close with this quote from uh, Apostles of Denial book. First Timothy 6 is taken as a reference to Christ in support of the invisible second presence theory. Stress is placed on the clause in verse 16, whom not one of men has seen or can see. The truth is those verses are not to be understood of Christ, but are a doxology to the greatness and glory of God. A check of more than 10 sources by this writer revealed this same understanding with none to the contrary. Included in these sources were five books published by the Society, written by Russell and Rutherford. In addition, both Thayer and Gingrich also understand the verses to refer to God. Therefore, other reasons could be given. There's no reason to apply the passage to Christ. More interesting information about the organization's history regarding this verse, because according to this writer, the early founders of the movement what became known as the Jehovah's Witnesses, who were at one time known as the Bible Students, some of their founders like Russell and Rutherford actually did not apply this verse to Jesus, but obviously to God. 